Well, hello there and welcome to the Terry Cole Show. I am so psyched that you are dialing into this really fascinating conversation I had with my new pal, Dr. John Deloney. John wrote this, he's written other books as well, but I really love this new book that he has out, which is called Own Your Past, Change Your Future, A Not-So-Complicated Approach to Relationships, Mental Health, and Wellness. And what I find very interesting about Dr. John Deloney is that he is a real straight shooter, makes very complicated, theoretical things, incredibly accessible, which I really appreciate. I'm going to tell you a little bit about John, a national best-selling author, mental health and wellness expert, and host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. That's actually where I knew him from, was his show. He holds two PhDs, one in counseling education and supervision, and the other in higher education administration. Before joining Ramsey Studios, John spent two decades working as a senior leader at multiple universities, a professor and a researcher, and a crisis responder. So now at Ramsey's personality, he teaches people how to reclaim their lives from the madness of the modern world. And we spoke a lot about how to, what are the five steps that you can take to heal things from the past that are getting in the way of you creating a life that you want and that you deserve. I super enjoyed my conversation with Dr. John Deloney. I hope that you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed it. I'm so excited. Welcome, Dr. John Deloney, to the How Terry Cole Show. You doing well? I'm doing great. I'm so pumped for our conversation. Ah, I can't wait. I'm so grateful for your hospitality. Not at oh, all. So, like, let's have fun. Let's have fun. We're doing it. There's so there's so many questions that I have though, and so many parts I want to dive into. At the top of the show, I already told them all the stuff that you do, and I gave them my personal sort of experience of when I knew I was going to be interviewing you. I jumped on your YouTube channel because I've got one as well, and I was like, oh. and I was, la- I was laughing to myself so hard because you have a very special skill of making complex theoretical crap very accessible. <laughs> And actionable, because I love that you give a lot of stories. You're like, and for example, that you, you're great on your feet. You know this, John. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'm just acknowledging it because it is a special skill to be really good on your feet when you're just answering live questions from people. It's not like you know what they're going to be. And that, I'm, I'm always impressed where I'm like, that tells me that you obviously know what you're doing. But anyway, this book is also oh, you. phenomenal. You're welcome. Um, own Your Past change your future, a not so complicated approach to relationships, mental health, and wellness. This, by the way, you guys watching on YouTube, if you're listening, available everywhere right friggin' now. So if you want to get this amazing book, Amazon, all the places you can get it. In the meantime, I want to just start with, just tell us a little bit about the book. Oh man. Um, (laughs) I guess the, the, starting with your audience, they'll get this. Um, I, I don't know that the world needed another complex book about a new um, theoretical framework for how to approach psychiatric disorders or another complicated book on marriage. or What I found over my academic career, I worked in colleges for 20 years, uh, almost 20 years, was, man, some incredible people who are really – um, bent on solving really hard problems and helping people and serving people. And then when I left and started doing this, started getting on the road and meeting with people who run gas stations and meeting with people who are uh, run roofing companies, I realized, oh no, we've been, I I personally, I'll, I'll say me, I've been talking past people for a long, long, long time. And given the um, challenges in traditional therapy these days, and there's money, many of them. Mm-hmm. Really, I wanted to sit down and say, okay, what would this look like if I just sat down across the table from somebody over chips and queso and said, tell me about you, right? And let's figure this thing. Let's figure out the next wobbly step here. Um, so that was the that was impetus number one. Impetus number two was I kept hearing from my friends, from my callers, from my neighbors. They're trying to solve a specific problem. And I kept saying that that problem's not really what the problem is. They were looking at their gas gauge on their dashboard saying, how do I get the light telling me that I need gas to go off? 
that's not the problem. You know what I mean? So they're like got screwdrivers and trying to wedge the, the dashboard off and try to figure out how to get the lights unplugged. And it's like, well, if, if you just go back there and put gas in the car, the light goes off. And so <laughs> it was this – I felt like my my friends, my neighbors needed a different approach for what is sold as, quote, unquote, traditional mental health these days. And we have a mess on our hands, but I think it's a different kind of mess than we're being sold. I – Love that. And and it's interesting. I feel I totally agree that it's like I can see in my own work that I'll sometimes get not that I'm bored with what I'm teaching, but feel like it's got to be more. It's got to be different or it's got to be more complicated. And the reality and what you're really sharing in this book, this is like the meat and potatoes of healing. Yeah. And it's accessible to anyone who is interested in healing. So it, it really doesn't have to be, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just it's saying real hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it, real hard. Yeah. It's real hard because people don't want to go back to the gas station. That's, that's exactly right. You know what I'm saying? Like we just want to, especially if going. you got hurt at the gas station, right? If you got hurt at the gas station in the past and the, the gas station has been, been traumatic and, and awful and there's mm-hmm. tragedy back there. No, nobody wants to go back there. That's, they the only don't. Way, that's the only way to fill your car up. Right. So yeah. Uh, well, thank you so, so much. It's, it's great. But I want to talk about, we were talking about what, you know, there's so many things in the book that I wanted to talk about, but I'm really personally obsessed with hmm. codependency. This is something that oh, I teach. I've got wonderful. courses. It's, I've got my whole special take on the whole thing, but what you're talking about, I find so incredibly fascinating. So let's get into it. The codependencies right. that parents often have with their kids. Right. Well, let's talk about it. <laughs> share share why this is a part of what you're teaching about and what what is your view on how this has come to be we're we're in a strange snapshot of history and it i i know that it won't last long because it can't <laughs> where we have made our children the cornerstone of our homes and our communities and it's their development and their wishes and dreams and their passions and them evidently the cosmos or God or whatever you believe in has hidden their quote unquote calling somewhere in their life, like an Easter egg. And their job is to spend 18 to 25 years finding where the cosmos hit it. And so we need to do everything right. And kids have also become our parenting report card our scorecard. Mm -hmm. And so if little Johnny's good on the baseball field or little Susie's good on the baseball field, then um, that means I'm doing good as a parent. And my job, my my identity is in how good Timmy's grades are or how how strident I can force the school district to a, a appeal to my kid's peanut allergy, right? They've become our reason for being. Mm. And they've also become our – they've become responsible for the emotional well-being of the adults in their home. Um we all remember, hey, don't say that. Dad gets mad. Or, hey, um, if you do that, mom's going to come unhinged and start slamming stuff. Don't do mm-hmm. that. And what it was like a light bulb moment for me one day when I was like, we're, we're asking seven-year-olds to modulate the emotional reactivity of adults. They can't do that. Uh, here's the other good one. Kids, uh, the number – I don't know you've done this too. The number of parents who are 40, 27, 33 – if I say, hey, you sound really lonely. Who are your friends? And they're like, oh, my daughter's my best friend in the world. And their daughter's 15. Mm-hmm. My son is my best friend. He's 20. He's about to graduate college. We are best friends. And I, I just say, poor you and poor that kid and yep. poor your neighborhood. So here's the thing. We have, we have balanced our entire cultural ecosystem on top of children. Mm-hmm. And they are not strong enough to carry us, our adult problems, our traumas, our wor- complex world challenges. And the world is crumbling under the weight of these kids trying to hold us all up. And we got, I've got, I'm all about, dude, I'm, I paid attention and I love Piaget more than anybody, right? And my wife is a Vygotsky expert. Like, I love all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And my kids know really, really emphatically, you do not run this house. You <laughs> You do not have the power to make your dad mad. You're not that strong. You're you're 12. You're six, right? Yep. And they need to take their rightful place where they belong as children, not yeah. as captains of a ship that they are not strong enough to drive. Wow. Now, 
y- y- those of you listening, those of you watching, really allow that to sink because the I, the, I couldn't possibly agree with you more in that <laughs> the pendulum has swung, you know, think about the last 100 years or last 200 years, right? Of how you know, there was a time when kids were going to work at the age of six in the fields. I mean, this, this is real too, right? Yeah. And that wasn't even that we're talking about that's in the last 100 years, like 100, right, 150, right? right? Yeah. And by the way, that's not better. Treating kids like cattle isn't better. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not saying we need to go back there and have 14 children and they can, you know, if a couple of them pass away. That's fine. Exactly. That's not, that's not the goal either, right? No, of course not. But what we're saying is that, or what you're pointing out, and I'm in agreement with this, this pendulum has swung. And it is the, what you're proposing in the book is that parents do their own healing work. We're going to get into these steps next. That's the next thing I want to go to. Because then the result is that your children are not carrying the emotional weight for the family. I, I would see with my, my therapy clients for years where they're like, well, my, my kid won't, won't nap. I'm like, they won't nap. I'm like, okay. So she's like, I'm never sleeping. They sleep in bed. You know, all of these things again, where the, a three-year-old is, has the power that they do not want yeah. to determine whether they nap or not. My mother was all like, Hey, you can not close your eyes, but go in that room. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like mom needs, I got four kids under the age of six. I need an hour right. or I'm going to blow right. my rent out. Like, right. So, yes. so, you know, do that. But again, it's the approval. There's so much approval seeking and I would see it with my clients and I would be trying to, with them, write the ship of it. You cannot need your children's approval, but because of this role reversal that has been happening and not in the traditional way that we see it in like, let's say alcoholic families or neglectful families where you see a a parentification, that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about very dutiful. worship. Yes. 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 Worship is the right word because these are dutiful, super dialed in parents, right? So we're not talking about people like leaving kids on their own, but it's too much. Um, micro attention is what I've seen. And it's really what you're talking about where every nuance of a child's mood of something that happens, like it's okay for a kid to not be psyched about a decision that you make or a limit that you put, they're not going to be psyched. And you, your feelings as a parent, our job is to just always parent. It's not fun. Sometimes it sucks. Sometimes <laughs> you're the bad guy, right? Like, but you, yes. you, you can't be like, I'm pissed that you're hurt. I I was just talking to someone who was going through, their kid was going through, they're 14 and, you know, acting like an asshole. You're like, right. Yeah. Because they're 14. Correct. Age appropriate. (laughs) (laughs) And she's like, oh, yeah, like all hurt, all, all hot and bothered about it. I'm like, dude, you got to try to ferret them through this experience. And you can't be super tender and super thin skinned about them needing to be a jerk to, you know what I mean? To, to separate and individuate from you. Now, other people have different theories. There's a whole theory out now that says kids don't, you don't have to separate and individuate. My thought is a lot of teenagers are going to go through crap and they're going to be mean and they're going to be snotty and they know everything and you know nothing and you're all bougie or whatever. That's our kids. You should say to us, Oh God, call each other, babe. You're so bougie. Oh, I didn't even know what that meant. (laughs) This was like 20, 15 years ago. I was like, bougie. What are you talking about? But I was like, yes, we're uncool. And that's fine. You know why? Because we're not friends. (laughs) And I don't care. You're not my, that's right. You're, you're my, I I couldn't (laughs) absolutely, you know, who's still awesome. My bands that I liked when I was in high school and I, I could care less what you think of them, but I know this, we're going to listen to them because I'm driving <laughs> and I run the, the, the CD player, right? So yeah, it, it's a strange, it's, it's, it's a, when, when I tell parents this, always there's pushback. My kid is special and you don't understand. And the other push, the other, if you can get them to engage the conversation, you see parents have this, whew, it's an exhale that they have chained themselves to the reactivity of a seven-year-old, of a nine-year-old, of a 14-year-old. That I love how you said that. They don't want that. They can't handle that. They can't manage that. What they really want is you to be a grown-up. 
Mm-hmm. And I, when a 14 year old acts like a 14 year old, you know what I think? Good for you. Yeah. Because their job is to test the boundaries of the world. Does gravity work? And if it doesn't, every time they, they run up against one of your boundaries, you knock it down for them. Then they are going to walk through world, the world completely untethered. Yes. And they're going to enter into the workforce completely untethered. They're going to enter into the voting booth completely untethered because you haven't told them, here's how the world works. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that's our job as parents. And you said it best. It sucks. It's boring. <laughs> it's so boring. It's <laughs> it not is. fun. I'd much <laughs> rather have most of my money back and be having <laughs> sex like we did before. I, I want all that stuff. But I love my children. I know. Right. They're just not they they aren't the sun to our solar system. Exactly. And so so moving this forward in the in the first chapter. You basically lay out these, the paths to kind of like steps to take five steps repeated over and over again. So let's talk a little bit about the steps to well-being, because here's the thing. Keep in mind, parents who are listening, we're talking about this the way we're talking about this, because we're both parents. We've had our own experiences. It's not about saying we're perfect and you're bad. There's got to be some levity in this oh, yeah. whole life experience, like there has to be, but know that if you are feeling the burden that John was just talking about, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not focusing that light on your child. Cause you're doing that enough plenty. Now it's focusing that light on you and healing what needs to be healed in you. So you are not seeking to have a seven-year-old fill up your bucket when they cannot lift to the water or fill the bucket. Like it's not their job, but they also literally actually can't do it. So it's beautiful. You know, beautiful. I'm, I'm, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm saying we're being light, but I don't want it to be like I'm being flip about it or that I'm being judgmental because I made all the mistakes in the world as all parents do, as my mother will tell you, Dr. John, <laughs> she said to my face, well, don't worry, because I was all like critical when I was young, like, oh, well, these are all the ways you messed up, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, <laughs> you know, Terry, don't worry. You won't make my mistakes when you have kids. You'll make all of your own. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so here, here's a like, uh, here's a very <laughs> real example. So I was in grad school, and uh, I'll never forget, we were sitting in a, in a circle as therapy classes are, are, are want to be. And we're sitting in a circle and our professor throws a case study out and he says, you've been seeing clients, a client for six months. You love this client. You've been working really well with this client. And they come in one day and they are raged out on you. They're just super angry. I think I put this story in the book. I'm not sure if I did, but I think mm-hmm. I did. Um, and anyway, he goes on to say that, that the client yells at you, says, you wait, I've spent this much money and you're, you're just terrible at your job. You're not good. And I was new. And I said, man, that would kill me. I'd just been in my practicum, just seeing clients. Those interactions are very intimate. Mm-hmm. I was like, that would kill me. And one of my classmates, um, she's so wise. She said, John, they don't get that. And I was like, oh, gosh, is that counselor mumbo jumbo? And she said, no, they don't get that. You get to decide who hurts you. People can frustrate you. They can take away your livelihood. They can take your life from you. But you choose who hurts hurts you Mm. and um so we went through this exercise i was riding my bike home this very day this is the most providential like a b c d algorithm i've ever experienced i drove home and i'm thinking okay who did i give permission to hurt me then if i imagined a box on my kitchen table who would i put in there and say you five or six people are the only people i took my parents out who i love dearly i took my in-laws out who i've got the best in-laws in the world took them out they aren't living my life. They're not in my home. They don't have a vote on my life. Me and my wife do. Mm-hmm. And so then I put my wife in that box and I put a few of my close ride or die friends in that box, a couple of mentors that I trust that have permission to call me and say, Deloney, stop this behavior because I've given them permission to speak into my life. I walk in my front door and I rode my bike. And so it's a hot, windy Texas day. I ru- walk into the front door and my son is two, maybe he's three. And he meets me at the door and I say, Hey, his name's Hank. I said, Hey Hank, um, you want to play? And he looks at me and goes, no daddy. And he sprints down the hallway. And the first thought in my head was, cause you suck at being a dad. <laughs> cause it's Saturday and you're sitting there in grad school and because you got to meet these little needs cause you're insecure. And this poor kid is sitting here on a Saturday all by himself cause his father's abandoned him. That was the thought. And as I sat down that evening to kind of work through what was who would go in the box and my grad school stuff, I thought, wait a minute. We don't let three-year-olds vote or drink or buy bullets because they're three. 
how am I giving this kid access to me, right? And so, I mean, it was like on a dime. We flipped it. And some little things in my house now, now that he's 12 and my daughter's six, they'll, they, you know, on the fourth time, hey, pick up your towels, pick up your towels. Dude, pick up the towels. The fourth time, I don't say, you're really making me mad Mm -hmm. or you're really frustrating me or I'm really disappointing you. I don't ever want him to think he has that kind of power over me. Mm. What I will say is I'm choosing to be frustrated right now because I've asked you four times and a cornerstone of this house is dignity and respect. And a cornerstone of dignity and respect is picking up your towels and you have a role to play in our home. The home doesn't work without you. I'm choosing to be frustrated. And so he knows his choices have consequences and I don't control dad's mood. And that's what that, and so it's me trying to heal, right? Walking out of that situation. So you're 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 right to point on it's not making light of it. This stuff's hard. And as parents mm-hmm. we default to those old stories when our kids, you know, <laughs> trigger us. And we have to be intentional about re taking taking control back of our homes. Mm-hmm. And and what a relief it is for Oh, such a gift. So great. For for you and for the child. Yes, because they they feel um, from my therapy practice. I, I had a client who, you know, she she wouldn't discipline her kid. So she had a three year old daughter who was really acting out terribly. And the mother, my feeling was she was afraid of her. This is it just it resonated that there was all this fear. And she had a son before that who and she was a long term client who she parented very very, um, it seems seamlessly, she and her husband, right? Appropriate, positive and negative, dis- like all, all the things that you would do, but there, there wasn't this angst that came along with parenting the daughter. And so finally we got to, I was like, okay, so who does Susie remind you of? Like, where have you felt like this before? What What is going on here? And we were able to make this connection and again, this is going to come back to your stories because I said we we're going to do the five steps and we need to. <laughs> about this was that her daughter reminded her of an abusive sister that she had had and the daughter's rage that a three or two year old can have of course was incredibly threatening to the client so it was like she became the child again and couldn't and couldn't go through with giving a timeout, whatever. And then she comes in after we decide, okay, we, we reveal all of this. It's such a relief. Okay. She's going to parent her, the, the, you know, she wants to do the right thing for the kids. She doesn't want the kid feeling burdened by this lack of discipline that needs to happen. And she literally comes in she's like, you're not going to believe this. I put Susie in her first timeout and she came out of those five minutes with the biggest smile on her face. And she was like, hi, mommy. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Susie's friggin' relieved. She's like, look, yeah, I dude. just handed the keys to the van back to my mother. I don't have to try to drive anymore, you know? That's right. What a gift. Yes, 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 yes. So let's talk about the five steps, shall we, that we're repeating over and over again. We're starting with own your stories. Yes, I think it's important to note, um, anytime it's like 2.30 in the morning and I'm still awake, which is super rare these days, and especially in the old QVC days and you're flipping channels and you see like 14 ways to lose weight now or seven steps to the new growing fuller, thicker hair. I, it's so dismissive because it's so um, it's 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 just so ridiculous that you can distill it all down. So I don't want anyone thinking that I've created the five step plan for getting what <laughs> this is not how life works. Nothing in this book is original to me. Um it's just looking at ancient wisdom, at um, things that have worked throughout history across all different cultures and religions. Say, how does somebody ultimately live a life worth of meaning, worth well? And it's mm-hmm. it in my the way I it ultimately ended in these five steps. And it's interesting. I finished the book and didn't have those in there. It was the editor that called and said, "Hey, you realize there's a path through this for everybody?" And I said, "No, I don't want a path. I want to be cool and edgy and artsy." And she said, no, there's for sure, like you, the way you've, so ultimately you have to own those stories. That's the first thing. Um, as, as you mentioned, what's going to happen in that mom's life who has a th- raging three-year-old is there's going to be a cycle of build up and explosion and build up and explosion. Eventually mom's going to snap and she's either going to say something she can't get back and you're going to be in the ballpark of true trauma She's going to avoid that kid, and that kid is going to spend her entire life wondering, why doesn't my mother love me? 
And that child is not is not sophisticated enough to understand mom's got her stuff. So the kid's brain says, it's you, and you got to bridge, you got to build a bridge. And that kid will get into drugs, will find connection and and pseudo intimacy all over the, the, the playing field, or we'll get straight A's. It's all the same pathology. The kid is trying to say, will you see me? Will you see me? Right. And mom will continue to hide and continue to hide. And then she'll um, strike out. She'll abandon. Right. So all these things happen when really, as you, you so eloquently stated, the real problem is that little girl had some very similar mannerisms, some similar vocal tones, some similar lashing out as something that happened years ago. So we have these stories that we were born into, these stories we were told. Quite honestly, this is unpopular to talk about these days. The stories of the things we did, many of us contributed in some shape, form, or fashion to the challenges and misery we have in our adult life. Mm -hmm. I just made some dumb choices. I was a kid, and so I give myself a pass on that. I mean, I'm not um, going to walk around holding my head in shame. But I have to look at the algorithm and say, well, I put that variable in there. That one's on me, right? And there's, <laughs> right. There's, in my life, there's many, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've got to look at these stories, the ones that, you know, some of us grew up in a house where God doesn't exist. And some of us grew up in a house where God is your best friend and just looking out for you to do the best thing ever. And then for some people that grew up in a house where God is watching you, and if you screw up, he's going to torture you for eternity with a smile on his face, Right. That's just the story you're born into, and that story has physiological consequences. The cortisol and the adrenaline that pulse through our bodies for a lifetime, right? And so ultimately, our, our adult behaviors are all – and I wish this wasn't the case. It sounds so cliche <laughs> – are, are almost entirely physiological responses to things that we've been a part of or experiences from the past. <laughs> and I have to stop for a second and say, hey, this happened to me. I was abused as a kid. I was passed over for a job because I'm the wrong color. I don't um, – I, I I said that thing to that girl that I was serious about, and it was – what I said was wrong, right? We have to own those stories before you move forward. Right? It's like getting out of debt. You have to first <laughs> write down, here's what I owe to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. You can't get out of debt if you don't know how much debt you have. It's it's a, it's it's an accounting of our lives, and most of us are running from things so hard all the time that it's really tough to sit down and, and take that accounting. Yeah, and and how do we, you know, the the next step is about acknowledging reality. That's the hard one. That's mm -hmm. looking in the mirror in the present, and saying, "I've been married for fourteen years." And the picture in my head was a rambunctious sex life and we're always laughing and we're sneaking off to go dancing and our kids are making straight A's. And this is the life I have because that's where you're starting from. That's your starting line. Or I didn't mean to wake up and be 100 pounds overweight and unhealthy mm -hmm. and my knees hurt and my neck hurts. But this is where I am. Yep. Full stop. I didn't mean to say have said those things in the past with my spouse, but I did. I have to acknowledge reality. Here is the state of things. And our culture, we are terrible at acknowledging reality. Mm -hmm. We won't own it, man. We just won't own it. And um, I will contend that there is no healing without saying, okay, here's the starting line. Here's where we all are. What I, I love the, the framework of this, though, in the book where you get specific about what we're acknowledging the reality of, how far away you are from where you want to be right? Your relationships, like what is the actual state of your relationships? And as you said before, the choices that you've made. And I think that this is probably from all, if, if you can get to step two <laughs> and actually do it, then, then moving on, this is a heavy lift for most people. But I, I totally, from a therapeutic point of view, feel like there's no way around the middle, you know, like if there was a, if there was a shortcut, like I definitely would have figured it out. And so would you have probably, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been looking for one personal in my personal life forever. Right? Same. Is there a way around this? You know what I mean? Is there a, is there a control all delete? We, we spend so much time <laughs> trying to edit sentences in our lives that have already been written. The number oh. of times I have imaginary conversations with people from my past or I relive dates that I wish I could have done differently, or I relive 
conversations at work that I had or, mm-hmm. you know, when I cut ethical corners when I was in high school, a hundred percent of that is wasted energy. A hundred percent of that is wasted emotional toil that yeah. serves no purpose other than to spin up my cortisol adrenaline, put my body in fight or flight and go fight fights that are already over. Yeah. The greatest gift I can give my family, my family tree, my community, my workplace, myself is to look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm not going to try to edit any more sentences with periods at the end of them. I'm going to write something new. (laughs) And that's where most of us get stuck, right? So, so good though. I love it. All right. So what is number three? There is no zero zip none. And I I think this has been a major, um, I don't say failure because I don't like Mm -hmm. that kind of terminology. I think modern psychotherapy has gotten real distracted over the last hundred years from what healing looks like. And it partnered closely. It breathed the air of the individualistic society that we live in. So I'll say this really with a full stop exclamation point at the end. There is none. Zero long-term behavior change. There is no long-term wellness or health, physical, spiritual, psychological. There is no long-term life with joy in it that is done in isolation. Mm. It's a nerdy way of saying you cannot do life alone. You have to have a gang. You have to have friends. You have to have a tribe. And we have a society that I think, um, I think we have the loneliest culture in the history of humankind and we're asking our bodies to do things it simply cannot do, which is to do everything alone. It's impossible. So most psychology books I've, I've read want to jump into, you know, the cognitive behavioral aspect or the relational aspect. I'm going to start everything, stop everything and say, you cannot do life alone. So before you head out into the woods to start healing, you've got to take people with you. So what, what do you say? to folks who are already in the isolation phase of their life, like meaning they've, they've already, you know, the pandemic wasn't super helpful for many yeah, folks, geez. right? <laughs> the opposite Talk about of dumping diesel fuel on a, on a fire, man. Wow. Yeah. So, so what do you think some steps that people can take if they want to have more community, mm-hmm. but they don't, you know, where they sit home and they just are on their computer or whatever. So I, most of the work I do um, behind closed doors is with business owners and people who are, are in leadership positions. What I have found is there's not an easy way to say um, loneliness is killing you. And I've heard, I've heard it put by the great Peter Tia said, it calls it long tail suicide. Mm-hmm. It is, we are Netflixing ourselves and Amazoning ourselves and lonelying ourselves to death slowly over time. And when we do that, we suffocate everybody in the world around us. And so I think first I have to look at somebody in the eye and say, I'm an introvert too. I love my books and my data. And I live out on some acres in the middle of the woods in Nashville. I like being away from all people. (laughs) That's just, that's where my happy place is. Um, And I have to recognize, I have to sit with the data that tells me that will kill me. And so I have to have friends. And by the way, when I'm with friends and I'm with my close 30-year friends or I'm with my new friends, we're going to a concert tonight. And listen, Terry, it's an old heavy metal show. I'm getting in a mosh pit as a 40-year-old. It's going to be incredible. I can't wait. <laughs> um, I went to one this weekend. It was it was chaos. I'm like the dad in the, in the, in the crowd now. I'm like, hey, kids, slow down. And But listen, <laughs> it was like my wife saw me the next morning on, on Mother's Day and she said, you have a light about you. Mm-hmm. And I just spent the evening running around with some buddies, you know, new friends of mine. Here's the deal. We have to have friends. And so if you're at home, if you are reaching out digitally, digital communication, it's hard to say this because I know it's not popular. That is not connection. When I text my wife all day and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I am transmitting information to her. I'm giving her data. I am not connecting with her. What's Mm -hmm. connecting with her is my eye crinkles and my shoulders and my body posture and me picking up my underwear and me (laughs) showing up when I say I'm going to show up and me um, honoring her needs preemptively. That tells her empirically, I love you. Just Mm -hmm. texting it, I'm I'm giving her a tiny tidbit of data. So, man, 
our digital relationships are great, but we've outsourced everything. I would look at that person you're talking about and say, I get it. The last few years has been terrifying. The last 10 years before that has been shape-shifting. We have to look at friendship as a set of skills, and we have to be honest to ourselves and say 99% of us did not get a picture of what adult friendship looks like. <laughs> we didn't get a picture of what adult love looked like. My dad had tons of people in his life. I don't ever remember a story that my dad went and like hung out with some dudes like, right. hunting with the guy. Like He just did stuff alone, and that's just a picture I had of what men are supposed to do. So we have to understand we're heading off into new territory. I have to be about the business of making friends, which means I have to risk. I have to be vulnerable. I have to worth like I, I'm going to sit at a table with a super oversharer, and it's going to be weird for all of us. I'm going to invite somebody to my house, and they're not going to know how to leave because they don't read social cues. That's just part of it. We got to get over it and get out there and start making friends. Full stop. End of story. Love it. All right, move over a little bit. You're like. In the side of the frame. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, where's it going? All right. So mo <laughs> moving into, agreed, we need friends and we can't do it alone. So what is the next step? Step number four. The next two really are kind of like a figure eight, which is, um, and this is taking most of the schools of psychological thought and dumping them all in the same bucket and being like, guys, <laughs> you're all saying the same thing. Um, you have to change your actions. I got to do something different. Um, we cognitive therapy over the last hundred years has become all about if I can just think the right thoughts in the right order, then I can quote unquote be well. And I'm calling nonsense on that. You've got to go do different things. I've got to act differently, and I have to take control of my thoughts. And that's that was probably the newest concept to me. Um, was this idea, and I got it from David Kessler, who's the world's foremost grief expert. Mm. Um, this idea, and he was, I, I remember him talking about um, these talks to parents who have lost their child, which is one of the, the worst things that can happen to you, you lose your kid, and that they would get stuck with these pictures of the kid in a casket or the kid mm. in their last few moments before they passed, mm. and they couldn't get that thought out of their head. And so he gave them an exercise where he'd have them close their eyes and, and imagine a, a yellow donkey or a purple elephant or something like that. And then they would all get that picture in their eyes and he, they'd say, open your eyes. And they would. And he said, you just proved to yourself you can control your thoughts. And they'd all go, ooh. All right. <laughs> so this idea that over time, when a negative thought lightning bolts into my head, I have a choice in that moment. Am I going to meditate on this thing? Am I going to spin my body up, my heart rate up? Am I going to let that warmth go in my belly? Or am I going to stop and say, nope, and I'm going to have another thought that's that's either beauty or that is solution-oriented that I'm going to focus on that thought instead. And the beauty is over time, our brains will adjust. It will stop with the pessimistic default setting, and it will roll over to a more joyful-centric, optimistic-centric, problem-solution-centric way of seeing the world. And that's just neuroscience. That's just not, not woo-woo stuff. Right. Um, but it's just that simple. Uh, and let's be honest, it's it's miserable hard to do that. It's yeah. so hard to do that. But I love the idea of, here's the thing, there are steps. I, in in, the, in this steps that you're repeating sort of over and over, you're really identifying where are you keeping yourself small with your story? Where are you continuing to harm yourself, right? Because when we think terrible things about ourselves and when we believe these crappy stories about ourselves, this is just continued injury, self-injury. And then moving into accepting, acknowledging reality. Like there are things that all of us experienced that really sucked, but being in denial of those things puts us at this disadvantage because how can we change anything that we're in denial of? So sure. again, it's, if you're listening, if you're watching and you're like, I want to be happier, I want to create something better than I have, right? Because that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about cleaning up or what your book right here was you guys, it's called Own Your Past, Change Your Future. You can buy it anywhere right now. <laughs> what your book, Dr. John, is talking about is how do, where do we go from here? And it's the truth. And therapeutically, we know this as clinicians. So much of the time when something is unhealed, we got to go back to go forward. And it isn't like, I know some people think that they're as therapists, like we just love talking about third grade. You know what I mean? I'm like, Hey man, <laughs> I literally never want to talk about third grade unless right, right. something in third grade is blocking you from creating the life you want today. Right. Then, right. I, I, I want to um, put a pin in something for the listener. I 
Um, I'm a big, idiotic, six foot two, hundred and ninety five pound Texas males where I was born and raised. Right. Mm -hmm. And somebody said the word um, soul injury or self injury. I would roll my eyes twice through the back of my head like, oh, gosh, get over yourself. Wasn't until I picked up Nadine Burke's Harris, Harris's work and I started I did a practicum with ACEs with adverse childhood experiences. And I began to follow the thread through the trauma literature that, it, oh, these aren't, quote unquote, soul injuries. Our bodies are literally eating themselves from the inside out. <laughs> so the, the way I. I, I, I've come to understand it is every morning, um, if or, or once a year, if I get a clog of hair in my sink and I dump Drano in it, it'll eat through that clog and we're fine. If every morning I just wake up and dump Drano into my sink, dump Drano into my sink, in very short order, it will eat through the pipes and I'm going to have a huge flood in my house. Mm -hmm. And that's what cortisol and adrenaline is. And every day when your body remembers the abuse – not your head. When your body remembers the abuse of that man and your partner comes in who has any semblance of uh, any any sort of resemblance to that person or that guy in the street or your coworker, your body spins up the cycle again and it spins it up again. And you're looking at an arc of more likely to get strokes and cancer and heart disease and dementia, all these things. You can't sleep because your body's alert to the threat. So these aren't just pie in the sky woo woo stuff. This is our bodies falling apart because we it, they're just spinning up the systems and spinning up the alarms and spinning up the alarms. We've got to let our sweet bodies rest. We've mm. got to let our bodies have whew, peace. And most of – you know this. Most of the people that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't even know what that would feel like anymore. Oh, it feels good. And so good, man. It's so good. Right? And it took for me many, many years of my yeah. own therapy to, to get to any – point of not being hypervigilant yeah. about safety and all of those things. I really feel like this book, John, is going to help so many people. Thank so you. It, you don't have to be a person who's like, I'm into self-help. If you're into creating a life that is more joyful, that is more abundant, that is more authentic, I really think you want to go out and get this book right now. And you can get it anywhere and everywhere that books are sold. Tell us. I want to ask you two questions. Well, one question yeah. about boundaries that I ask all my guests. And then you're going to tell it. us where everyone can find you. In your life, what was the most challenging boundary um, issue that you experienced? And how did you overcome it if you did overcome it? My life was oriented around trying to prove externally that I have value. And so probably the single greatest boundary violation was that I allowed other people's problems and my perceived ability to solve them um, to give me esteem. And ultimately, that took my energy away from my wife. It took energy away from my kids. It took energy away from my work because I was always scanning the environment for another problem for John to run in and solve. Mm -hmm. And when I look back with, in, with honesty – I hurt people doing that. I jumped both feet into their lives trying to solve their problems, and I wasn't even invited into that problem. And so um, the biggest solution I've had over the years is I don't answer questions I'm not asked. Um, I don't – I used to – God, dude, I was such a – I was a keto zealot. I was that guy. I was a workout zealot, the worst. I, every time I – in grad school, every class, I became the, that theoretical framework zealot. I just – I stopped. Um, I'm way more interested in a good fart joke now. I'm, I'm just, I'm just done with it. Um, I will show up in the middle of the night if you ask me to. Um, I am not going to presume unless you're one of the five or six or seven people in my core group. And then the understanding is real. You don't need to call. I'll be there. Right. And I've leaned on them and they lean on me, but that's the way I've had to, I've had to heal from my, there is no external plug to an internal hole, right? I've got to heal that from the inside out. Mm. And, um, I have to stop. I had to stop chasing validation. And now I'll tell you what, I sleep a lot better. <laughs> I sleep good. Man. I sleep real good. Um, but I've, I've stopped running into so many burning buildings unannounced. Yeah. I love that. There's no external plug for an internal hole. 
And it's just so true. Thank you. That was so beautiful and so, so well put. So tell everyone, where can they find you? Um, okay. I'm going to tell you, but I got to tell you, this is, this is my confession. You ready? Yeah. I do get a heads up of the calls on my show. So I'm not quite as, as smart as I wish I was. They do tell me. <laughs> so I just need to let you know that. Oh so gosh, um, I'm confessing. Uh, you can find me at johndeloney.com or you can follow me on the internet at John Deloney. Uh, Instagram is the one that I, I am on and I think it rolls over to some other platforms. I don't know how to even log into the other ones, but, um, that's the one I use and, um, you can pick up the book anywhere you buy books. I love it a lot. I want to say thank you so much for being uh, on our show today, spending so much time with us. I really, really appreciate what you're doing in the world. So thank you. I am grateful, grateful for your hospitality. You're such a gift. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.